them. And with vast experience in the agric industry, to be our speakers for today. And my role is just to moderate the entire session. I want to start first by giving just a brief introduction of myself. I'm a student of the Rome Business School, prestigious Rome Business School, Italy. I'm also a Global Gap licensed farm assurer. And I'll be introducing our speakers right now. But before I do that, I know that uh, we'll have to remind ourselves to please kindly mute yourselves as much as possible in the course of this conversation. And you can raise your hand when it is time for questions so that we can identify you and take your questions. So right about now, I'll be introducing our first speaker. And I hereby introduce Dr. Namperumal Anandaraj. I hope I'm correct. You're highly welcome, sir. I will take a brief snapshot of your professional profile. Dr. Anandaraj presently is working as the Chief Operating Officer of Chief Farms Limited, Lagos, Nigeria. He has over 23 years of work experience in the entire segment of poultry and agri industry, techno commercial. He studied veterinary medicine and animal husbandry and he also has vast experience in animal breeding and genetics from the University of Wagen, Wagen Gen University and Research in the Netherlands. He has done several programs in marketing, completed international business and global strategy in India Institute of Management. Is certified lead auditor in the Food and Safety Management Quality Control, registered with IRCA and SDGs. Uh, this is heavy, heavy, and I know that <laughs> Dr. knows uh, I've not gone halfway yet. He has a specialization in animal nutrition and feed milling technology from Kansas State University America Feed Industry Association program. He has a strong exposure in international markets, especially in India and African countries. Good hands on experience in computers, SAP, MM model, Tally, Navision. I mean, he has a strong tech IT background. He's married with two kids, a boy, 17 years, a girl, 13 years, living in Nigeria for the last 12 years. He's a life member in Indian Veterinary Council, Veterinary Council of Nigeria, International Meat Scientist Association and Poultry Association of Nigeria as an executive committee. He's an executive committee member in Indian Cultural Association of Nigeria. General Secretary in Tamil Association of Nigeria. A lot, a lot on your hands, Doctor. And I welcome you once again. Doctor, thank you. Voice, thank you, Daniel. I will quickly introduce our next speaker for today. Also, with a very rich background in the agri industry in person of Raphael M. Moirano. I don't know if Raphael is on with us, Professor Raphael. Is he on? We can't see him yet. But I'll run through quickly his, through his, his CV. He's an entrepreneur in agriculture and runs two farms in Southern and Central Italy. They produce Pecorino Crontanese DOP cheese. I had to I had to do some research on this, and I found that, that this cheese has a unique flavor. They also produce organic olive oil, cereals, oranges, and fresh vegetables. 
He was president of the Italian Young Farmers for six years, and now he's in charge of SDGs and sustainable sustainability programs in Confagricolatoria, one of the oldest farmers organizations in Italy and Europe. And uh, I think their history stems as far as the 15th century. He's a freelance journalist who worked for many political agencies and national newspapers. He's the chairman of GFAR, the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation at FAO. He's a professor of agribusiness management at Camerino University designed and runs the Agri Management Masters at Rome Business School. He's a member of the advisory board for Fondazione Patrimonio Italy, works with Gam Gambero Rosso, and he's a consultant for several startups and agribusinesses. Again, I say welcome, Professor Rafael M. Majorano. I hope is online with us. Once again, I welcome everyone on board and I'm sure you're excited just like I am to hear from our speakers for today. We're ex today's topic is exploring agribusiness value chain. And we understand that there is globally there is a lot of discussion around the food industry because a few days ago, we marked the World Food Day. And so this meeting is very timely. I will be passing the ball over to Dr. Anarag. I hope- Thank you. Thank you, engineer Daniel Bonardo. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the participants. Can I share my screen? Yes, please. You can, Doctor. I hope you can see the screen. <clears throat> can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Today we are. I'm going to discuss about the overview of Nigerian poultry value chain. In agriculture value chain, I'm going to take only the poultry value chain. <clears throat> what is Nigeria and the poultry sector? As all of you know, Nigeria is the country population. The 200 million population of 2019 is going to be doubled at 400 million as 2050. This is one of the uh, top 10 countries in the world population that time. That is also with 43% youth populations. So the population growth, not only the population growth, there is a high rural to urban drift and also increase in middle class economy with all these factors, either population growth and uh, urban drift and increase in middle class economy. All this will increase the demand for meat, especially for chicken and eggs. So in Nigeria, agriculture economy is the 35% of the GDP. In that, poultry subsector is the 25% of agriculture GDP. So the government of Nigeria giving more attention to development, that is reducing nascent import bill and also source of foreign currency by exports. These are the two policies that presently the government of uh, Nigeria is uh, using for agriculture. Nigeria is the one of the country, the poultry sector is growing six to 10% year on year from 2015 to 2025, as per the Robo Bank report of 2017. So this is uh, average growth of six to 10% year on year. <clears throat> if you see some facts on poultry in Nigeria, so this is the most potential country for poultry development in Africa. In the entire Africa, this is the most potential country they identified because of increase in population. And there is an import ban on poultry. You cannot import any poultry products. 
and there is a local demand and also the government incentive scheme. So <clears throat> the industry, among the all agriculture livestock industry, poultry industry is considered as the most organized industry in India. So as per a CBN estimate of uh, July 2020, the value of the poultry industry is 1.35 trillion naira. That is contributing around 24.8%, 25% of agriculture GDP. That is 7 to 8% of the country GDP is covered by poultry industry. As per USDA, the Nigeria is the leading country in Africa. In terms of egg production, it is number one. In terms of broiler production, it's number four. With a total bed of 185 million average beds, which is producing 480,000 tons of meat and 14.5 billion eggs per annum. So the per capita consumption is still very low, just 2.5 kilo and 65 eggs. Even though the consumption is low, still there is a serious supply deficit within the country, within the regions. If you see the poultry business operation in Nigeria, there is a three higher operations the grandparent operations, second one is the parent stock, the third one is the commercial broiler and commercial layer. So the grandparent stock, which is producing parent stock, the parent stock, <coughs> they are producing the hatching eggs, which will either both broiler or layer, they have three, two different lines, both the meat line and the egg line. So these three types of operation exist in Nigeria. Nigeria is the second country have the GP operation after South Africa. So in East Africa, Nigeria is the only country have the grandparent stock operation. <clears throat> what are the incentives for poultry farming in Nigeria? The government is get, given some incentives, some uh, supports. What are the supports? There is a demand gap for poultry meat and egg in, in the country. So now there is a big uh, gap between the production and the requirement. So the, currently the gap was, it was filled with chicken from uh, through Kotunu, through uh, different sources. So in response to this, the federal government has banned the importation of frozen chicken since 2003. Since 2003 up to today, there is, uh, there is no uh, importation, there is not allowed importation of any frozen chicken in the country. So, and also the CBN government, the, through CBN, the federal government provides a lot of low interest agri facilities like uh, CACS, NIRSAL, Anchor Borrower Scheme, which all these schemes will be single digit interest. <clears throat> that is only they're providing to the agriculture sector. Then the next one is there is a friendly government policies, the friendly tax policies to support the agriculture. For example, all agri machineries are duty free and all the agri products or poultry products are VAT exempt and unlimited tax carried forward, full capital allowance utilization. These are all the government policies to support agriculture. Many of the Nigerians, they are not using these facilities. Then the last one is the recent land border closure, which is stopping all the curbing all the smuggling activities. These are all the incentives or the supports from the government for the poultry sectors. What are the opportunities in the poultry sector? If you look into the entire poultry segment, since there is a demand for poultry products, so the rapid growing market due to increase in population and increase in average income. So there is a demand for the poultry products. <clears throat> there is a new investment or foreign investment which is providing latest technology and expertise. That is the <clears throat> one more. Next one is the input services for all the inputs, which is uh, uh, for the inputs for the feed, feed additives, drugs, vaccine, medicine, equipments, all this, there is a lot of avenue for this business, or these opportunities there. And feed quality standards and feed testing laboratory, there is very limited number of laboratories in the country for testing the quality or the, the, <clears throat> of the feed or the premixes. And very importantly, 
there is a big opportunity for poultry training institute or poultry schools or inter industry linked poultry practical approach because there is there is very very limited poultry training institute even though industry is growing very faster but the training institutes are very less that's all the, the, that is also an opportunity in the poultry sector <clears throat> if you go to the area of the opportunities where we can start the business in the poultry industries <clears throat> one is the broiler farming which is producing meat or live birds that is one avenue then uh, layer farming which is producing eggs and egg sales and uh, number three the breeder farms with the hatchery which is producing day old chicks there is a very big segment of the market and the feed mill which is supplying the <clears throat> supply or sale of feed or concentrate that is also one area the <clears throat> input or raw material supply there is a big gap between the maize and soya production and requirement in the country there is a big opportunity in that area for the supply of raw material and there is a feed additives like amino acid vitamins premix dcp all are imported to the imported to the country there is a big opportunity of distributor or dealership for that one and input distributor for medicine and vaccine these are all the few of the areas in industry for the opportunities existing like for not only the farming broiler farming and livestock there is other input supply feed additives medicine vaccine supply there, there is a chance for the laboratory or poultry institute and feed mills these are all the opportunities areas of opportunity in poultry industry <coughs> what are in the country in the poultry sector based on our experience the one is the high cost of production because the feed cost and other input cost is high and the performance is not up to the international standard that's why the cost of production of uh, poultry products are higher than international price then raw material availability and cost especially maize and soya is very scarce and high cost the maize and soya, like i mentioned maize and soya these are the 90% of the poultry feed which is produced less than the requirement in the country so uh, since they produced uh, less and also the forex availability is the major challenge and there's no defined quality standards for hatcheries so uh, there is no defined quality standards for day old chicks or feed or feed additive and vaccine and medicines so this the government federal government has started working on it now so smuggling of frozen chicken through porous border even though it's banned up to 2020 there is a lot of uh, smuggling of chicken was happened and in some areas there is insecurity in farming operations which is affecting the production and <clears throat> very importantly the poor technical knowledge of farmer or farm manager poor infrastructure lack of knowledge of innovation and lack of expertise if you see the all the farmer majority of the big farmers in nigeria they are a retired civil servant so they don't know the technical knowledge of the farmer so that's why now the new generation is coming with the lot of uh, technical knowledge <clears throat> the general question over uh, they will ask what whether the broiler or layer there is if you take the broiler operations there is two type of houses in nigeria if you see there is open side houses you can see in the picture other side the environmentally closed houses i no need to explain both uh, many of them uh, see this type of houses so the open side houses is made from wood or pipe or concrete cheaper than closed houses but it's less durable environmental conditions like temperature humidity ventilation all cannot be controlled so then so we can stock less number of beds less number of cycles less yield whereas the feed conversion ratio and mortality and the period will be higher in contrast to the modern houses now most of the houses is coming as environmentally controlled closed houses which is pre fabricated steel material the more expensive but is more durable environmentally controlled like uh, we can control the temperature humidity ventilation which will give higher density higher cycles and number of cycles are more the yield will be more and the rearing period quality will be less comparison of open side houses to closed side houses in broiler <clears throat> if we take the layer 
Later also we have uh, the same old type of open side houses and a closed battery cage system. Now I can say more than 70% of the farm is going to the cage system. So which is um, environmentally controlled and higher stocking density and more cycles and very less egg breakages and very less feed wastages. These are the advantages of closed battery cage system when compared to the open side houses. <clears throat> Which one we, we want to go? Meat or eggs? <clears throat> if we take the broiler farms and layer farms, if we take the broiler farm, the lower initial cost of startup, because the initial cost of startup is less, whereas high in layer. The turnover period is less in uh, broiler, say it is 38 to 40 days, whereas in layer, even for getting the production, we need to wait for uh, five to six months. So the broilers are, since they're rearing for very less, a few weeks, so the exposure are lesser when compared to the layer beds, which is raising for years. So the exposure to the prevalence of disease are higher in layer forms. <clears throat> so even if the broiler, if one batch is lost, we can recover, we can start again immediately, whereas layer to year to bring the next batch. <clears throat> the feed <clears throat> consumption and feed cost are higher in broilers, whereas feed consumption and feed nutrient, feed quality, or feed cost is lower in uh, layers. In broiler, for frozen chicken, we need expensive storage equipment, cold stair, blast freezer, because Chicken, you cannot store more than, more than some hours without a cold store. Whereas table eggs, we can keep at room temperature for weeks without getting spoiled. So that is the comparison of the cold store. So in general, <clears throat> broiler operation have shorter payback time, but brings in lower revenue and margin, lower margin in long term when compared to layer operations. In the layer from egg farm, even though large scale will bring more revenue than broiler, because after laying the eggs, the beds, the spent beds also can be sold out as a meat in Nigeria, which is more demanded. <clears throat> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ananda Raj. That was brief, concise, and as well as explosive, very insightful. Uh, I picked a lot, a lot of things uh, while you were speaking. And uh, it's exciting to know that the projected population of uh, Nigeria by the year 2050 will be two times what it was in the year 2019. And that means there is more or less a, a looming food crisis if nothing is done as we get food production. I also pick the fact that we have a number of entry points and opportunities in the poultry value chain, the broiler farming, the layer farming factory. But I want to quickly uh, recognize the presence of Professor Rafael Morano. You're welcome, Professor. And uh, very shortly, we'll be passing. Hi. We'll be... Good evening. You're welcome. <laughs> very shortly, we'll be. We have been itching to hear from you. And uh, after you make your presentation, I will start asking questions. So okay. may I ask? Yes. You're welcome. Professor. So thank thank you thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you thank you so much, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I am, I am, my name is Raffaele Maiorano. I am the master supervisor at the Rome Business School in Italy for the master in agribusiness management. Uh, I designed this master with uh, Mr. Ragusa, the actual, the actual dean, you should, I think you know Antonio. And uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we designed the master at the very beginning, the school was, was, still, was still a small one at the, at the time. Now it's, uh, it's, it's becoming, uh, bigger and bigger every year and as you know we have a new headquarter in Rome which is amazing and uh, but by the way when we designed it we, we start thinking about the value chain so what what's the value chain what is uh, uh, what is needed for uh, um, 
having and aiming that goals that all the students uh, um, wish to have when they study management and they want something in, in they want something to add to their own background in terms of skills for the agribusiness. The agribusiness means the entire value chain from the production to the logistics, distribution, uh, commercialization, marketing, and things. So um, uh, my personal profile is a profile that is uh, uh, strongly built on this because as, as uh, my personal core activity, I am a farmer. I have two farms in Italy. One farm is in the south of Italy and we are producers for wheat, cereals, vegetables. We, we, we had, have livestock and transforming cheese and transforming olive oil from our own olive trees. And uh, I have another farm in the center of Italy, just a couple of hours driving north to Rome in a region called Le Marche. And there we produce mostly cereals and we have uh, uh, a, truffle, uh, a truffle field, a truffle field for, for, um, with, with, with several trees. It's, it's, it's kind of an interesting and brand new business we are following up with. I am also a representative in Confagricultura. Confagricultura is one of the oldest organizations in Europe, uh, farmers' organization in Europe. And uh, um, there I was the president for young farmers for six years. And now I, I am the representative for them for SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. I am also the chairman at Interim, at GFAR, the Global Forum on Agriculture Research at FAO. So research is involved into my, in my personal profile. And I'm a professor at University of Camerino of agribusiness management too. So all of these, the farming part, the uh, research part, and the organizational part where the private sector is involved, this industrial industrial part is involved, and all the other mechanisms are involved at, at, at a big, big part of the uh, agribusiness and value chain. And the entire master is built on this. So in our master, we have uh, people that come from the farming experience, international organization, international cooperation, uh, where people that come from uh, uh, research and startup system, a uh, politics system. So uh, um, uh, this is how the, we understand that the value chain has to be described for the students. I have, a, uh, I have an image. Can I share something? I'm allowed to share, to share something. Yes, please. Uh, wait. Okay. This is a slide we always show. I always show in my when I do my 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 courses. There's a specific course on agribusiness uh, and the world food economy that, that explain the value chain. And this is how the uh, system is changing for the farming. And in this very slide, in this one, uh, uh, let's start from this one. In the past, there was this. Uh, input from technology, machinery, uh, and technology based on, uh, on, on pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical business and in pharmaceutical industry and uh, research in university. Plus there was all the mechanization. So we, uh, uh, we started to become more mechanical in terms of production, destruction and things. Uh, at the very present, the, the, the farmers has a lot of data and uh, we can say this is a confused farmer because he's overwhelmed by data. But the future, which is the, which is the content of the mass, sorry, I want to, I have a, okay, sorry. Uh, which is the content of the master uh, in agribusiness management at one business school is, very much based on data insight. So this, uh, uh, the, the future farm, we have a, a, a large part for tractors and mechanical, uh, mechanical innovation. Um, big part with sensor, plant sensors, and uh, biotechnology, all, all the, the biotechnology part. Um, uh, the, the Doppler for weather for forecast. I mean, these slides represent how much information every day a farmers can be provided by. And that means that there's to uh, be informed and there's the knowledge to understand how to deal with all this technology. Or we are trying to, uh, um, uh, to build new, professional, new professionals with people that is an expert in this kind of innovation and will go into the value chain, directly into the value chain, uh, uh, exchanging information and exchanging knowledge. Something that is transversal 
right now, in my opinion, and has to be considered everywhere when we talk about the value chain, is all the sustainability, the sustainability part. And the SDGs are at the very center of the sustainability when we talk about farming, because if you look at, this, uh, at the SDGs, uh, most of them are related to the value chain in agri in agri in agri business. So uh, zero hunger is strongly related to to the value chain. Good health that means that the, the, so the food security and food safety. The quality education is going to be much more important for the reason where I was talking before. So being informed and improving your own skill uh, for uh, for 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 the agri business. Gender equality is a huge part. Of uh, um, the agri business into into the actual into the actual time, clean water and renewable energy are two SDGs strongly related to the agri business because the energy can be applied and can be produced by farmers. And uh, the 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 question of the water is uh, is good and it's important not just for the production but also for the sanitization. I think um, jobs and economic growth are at the begin at, at the very center of the agribusiness economy, of course. We need infrastructure and innovation for them. Reducing inequalities, so the, the clean job for everyone is super important. The, 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 the one is related to the uh, smart cities, and the smart cities have a strong relation with the farm, with the farms and the agri-industry, so the food uh, supply for the, for the citizen. A responsible consumption is transversal. Climate action, uh, agribusiness sector is one of the sectors that is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, leaving directly and strongly the effect on a, a bad climate, uh, climate situation we are living with. So the climate action is important for us, not just because we need to solve it, because we live in the same world and, 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 uh, and, and, and so on, but also because we have to deal with weather forecasts to be more better producer. Uh, uh, life below water is for fishery, life on land is agriculture, peace and justice. If everyone has the power of being uh, involved into, uh, into uh, an economical system which works, we're going to have peace and justice. And passage for the goals is the transversal one. So passing from an eco system, an ego system to an eco system is mandatory. And um, uh, when we talk about the value chain, we have to consider uh, some uh, uh, some things and uh, in the book I wrote the uh, which is SDGs for business we are using the um, SDGs and we are teaching to the students at Rome Business School too how to you how to uh, improve the impact of their activities um, uh, impact of their activities related to the some of the goals that we call complementary, which are the goal number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and thirteen and fourteen, uh, put it in on a on a on a business model, um, because the uh, the value chain has to be considered in something that is uh, not unique as it was considered uh, until now, when there was. The primary, the, the primary sector and the primary activities, the industrial part, the, the logistic, and so on. Now it's uh, as to as to be uh, uh, considered as something which is a unique ecosystem, and this is what we are aiming when we uh, when we start. Uh, the, the, the we had the, the the intake for the new students two days ago, and uh, this is where the discussion was built for so uh, it, it, it I'm, I'm sorry because in 10 minutes in 15 minutes we can't really deal with a, a program of uh, 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 200 hours for them so it's uh, it's it's a complicated fit but uh, I, I hope that you understand how we are uh, considering the value chain into the uh, integrity and in, in and in systematic way thank you Thank you, you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor <laughs> Raphael. That was very insightful. I I took notes of several things, and uh, particularly, uh, what struck my interest most was the the ecosystem approach yeah. to the value to the value value chain thinking, and uh, I'll be I'll be coming with questions right away because uh, the very first 
thing that strikes my mind is how friendly is our current method of agribusiness. The commercial agribusiness currently, uh, how sustainable is it? How much of these values do you see being embraced in the current system of our agriculture? I would like Dr. Anandaraj to kindly make his uh, response to that, give his response to that question. In the poultry industry, how sustainable is it? Yes. You'll be unmuted in a minute, a second. Yes, Daniel. <clears throat> Can you repeat the question? Yes, my, my question is that seeing the, the global concern of sustainability in agribusiness. I wanted to get your feedback as to how sustainable the current commercial system of the poultry industry is. How sustainable is it? I can say that the current commercial uh, poultry operation is sustainable because it is a food industry and the consumption, the demand will be always be there. And especially, uh, it will give the protein supply to the country, to the people, everybody. That is one. And secondly, they can raise at different levels of operations. If you are going for any other business, they have to go on a bigger level. And whereas in poultry, they can, based on their, uh, uh, their working capital, based on their investment, they can go to the different capacities. That is also the majorly the demand for the meat and the egg is huge in this country. As of now we are speaking, there is a big demand for the meat. So, and especially there is a uh, ban on the poultry products. So that is a big advantage to give the sustainability of the business. You are muted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anandaraj. Uh, Professor Raphael, you know, uh, I have friends who are, some, some of them are lawyers, medical doctors, and uh, from different fields. And they come to me and ask, say, I want to go into agricultural business. Mm. Good for and, them. <laughs> yes, and basically the reason is when they look at the profitability of agribusiness on paper, it's very interesting, very attractive. But in reality, there are so many shocks. So what are the challenges with venturing into agribusiness? This is, this is very true. On paper, uh, making a business plan, a business plan uh, it's, uh, it, it's easy, actually, and, uh, but at the end of the year, you, your account is not the same you considered at the beginning of your, of your activity. This is, this is very uh, unfair from some point of view. Um, and I think it depends from many, many factors. From one side, I think that the size of the uh, farm is important. Um, unfortunately, and I mean, unfortunately, size matter. Size matter because in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem we are living now, when, can I, I, I'd like to show another slide because uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Raj was talking about the poultry even before. And uh, I have, a, I have a, a, a slide that shows the duck and white chicken trade. Yes. How it works normally. And uh, this kind of slides always, uh, always um, uh, attract me because you can see that the, the, the chicken flies from, from one continent to another super easily and uh, uh, it becomes much more expensive, uh, not safe in, some, in most of the cases and uh, non-sustainable in terms of uh, 
um, you know, uh, uh, CO2 and, and these other things. So when we consider that uh, uh, to build an agribusiness, first things is size matters. So how big is your investment? What you're doing, for example, where the demand is very high uh, and Nigeria is a, a big demand of poultry. You are, uh, I know that because we had a lot of students from, from Nigeria and uh, I, most of them were in the agribusiness management class because they wanted to make investments into the poultry and into the rice, uh, into the rice business. And I believe that we studied that. I believe that poultry and studies, because you are net importer, actually totally net importer and big consumer. So this is just an example. But if you look at the business, if you push and make an investment in something where the demand is already high, you can, uh, and is not satisfied by the internal demand, in the internal offer, of course, this is something you can do. If you want to produce just cereal, which is uh, uh, because you want to be a farmer and produce cereals or vegetable without any, uh, having any kind of contract or having any kind of uh, um, uh, overview about the possible demand, your business will fail. And uh, if you have uh, insert in your, into, your business, uh, into your business model, uh, the idea of contract and uh, possible demand this will help if you are going to uh, open a farm. The climate change is another thing that can be helpful in this occasion. Normally it's a bad, it's a bad, bad, bad thing, but in, 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 the, in, in the actual experience we are having, the, the, the weather is changing and, the, and, the, and is becoming more hot, will allow us to uh, produce things that are normally imported from South America or whatever is that. For example, in Italy, we are working, Italy, in Europe, also Spain and Greece are investing a lot in mango, avocado, uh, this kind of production where we are totally net importer from South America and Central America. And now we are producing and, 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 and selling for a, a very high price, lemon, um, different kind of lemon, the norm, lime that normally we didn't have until a few years ago. So. Uh, Size matter, the business that you are, try to sell the product before producing it, considering the positive effect of the world economy and uh, try to uh, uh, be innovative. The innovation, not just of product and of process, but the most important thing is the innovation of thought. Think fast, think before the others. This is my suggestion if you want to open up, to open a, a uh, uh, an agribusiness farm. You you switch. We have you switched off. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Raphael. <coughs> I don't know if Doctor Anand. Yes, uh, I can. Like I, I, yes, you asked a question. What are all the challenges? Uh, and your friends are from different fields. I want to start from that. The major challenges in the poultry business, especially. Is, 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 this is a livestock business. So they, their presence is very important. It's not like that somebody is starting the business, somebody will take care. That is the biggest challenge we are seeing in Nigeria. So even some of the farm owners, they don't know what is happening. So <clears throat> the presence in the farm and the fundamental knowledge in the farm is the two things are more important. And coming to some of the questions, our, our uh, participants, they are very actively, they are asking questions. One from Mr. Agnes, he was saying, <clears throat> I'm actively involved in various agriculture value chain. One of the biggest challenges we face in poultry production and the price today is the high cost of feed. The price offered for poultry is very simple. He, he got the point. The major challenge is the, the feed cost. So since I mentioned the maize and soya, the production in the country, is less than the requirement in the country. So that is the reason. So how we are managing the big companies or others. If you take example, this country, especially the maize and soya, there is only two seasons. Only two seasons. That seasons, the price will be lesser. For example, as a chief farm, I want to give a model. <clears throat> now the presently, the maize, the price is around 160 to 170 naira per kilo. Where I got the season, 
last time it is 96 naira which i use for the <clears throat> this one that is the based on your so only two season the, the raw material is available so they have to uh, have the market and to find out that is the major things that is one then second one is how we can reduce the feed cost so especially in poultry i don't want to uh, just to give the alternative raw material because when you are going for other alternative other than maize and soya you will lose in performance so just only thing is the least cost formulations with available <coughs> uh, there is a lot of uh, software the lot of techniques are there to how to formulate least cost formulation for their beds that is also one we can reduce the feed cost <coughs> that is the other question and somebody is asking what value chain financial model would you recommend so in in poultry business if you say last 32 years of poultry industry except 2016 and 17 this the two years the poultry industry was not performed well other than these two years all the years the poultry industry in nigeria is performing very well i'm telling about the bottom line <clears throat> So, except 2016 and 17, whatever the cost increase, still the, the industry is doing well. So, the best financial model is based on their investment capacity, their working capital. If they don't have, if they have a good investment capacity, they can go for breeder farms with the hatchery, with their uh, day old chick sales. That is one of the strong business. If they have less, investment capacity they can go for layer farm that is uh, my option but majorly it depends on the uh, their technical knowledge and their uh, investment capacity wow that's 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 great thank you you you've uh, also addressed most of the questions on the chat but uh, as we mm -hmm. got in the financial model they would like okay. to hear from professor rafael yeah, for, for, for the financial model, we normally use the, of course, a normal business business uh, business plan structure, and uh, in the in the which is we takes everything in that from the business overview to the executive overview to to every content the 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 the, the demand the offers and and so on that you probably know a business model, it's uh, uh, the business plan model is uh, uh, super general and very effective. Plus, we are teaching how to use the business model canvas. I don't know if you are uh, if you are familiar familiar with uh, with the business model canvas. It's a super simple uh, business model overview uh, instrument, but it's very effective when you want to take a quick photograph of the two main um, two main two main things that you need. So the input and the output. From one side, you have the uh, customer with all the customer relations and how to get to the customers and channel. And on the other side, you have your partner, key partners, how you get involved with the partners and the suppliers and things. But the most important things that make the management considerably uh, active thinking about the, 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 the situation of the, of the companies that the, the, in the business model canvas, you have the um, uh, value proposition at the very center of the model. So it, it forces you to uh, understand which, which is your value proposition, so your, what you are offering to the others. And when you go to a bank, you can describe it. And uh, uh, in a financial, in a financial uh, for financial things, it's, uh, it's also important. But I, I suggest you if, you, if you're not familiar with the, bus, with the business model canvas, try to to have a look and uh, you can easily understand how to use it. It's much more easier than a business plan. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Raphael. And I believe that uh, those of us in the room business school are familiar with the business canvas model. I want to quickly recognize Mary Ibinosa. Your hands are up. I can. Uh, She'll be given the floor to ask a question, please, Mary. Thank you so much for the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay. I can hear you clearly. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is uh, very good to have this type of conversation about the value chain. And uh, I think this is just the beginning and uh, we hope to have much more. Uh, well, I want to believe that it's not just about poultry because um, if you look at our uh, landscape uh, environment, we need more of intensive diversification of uh, and uh, the continent and the country of Nigeria, for example, has a lot of biodiversity and a lot of things that we eat that uh, need to go um, into uh, intensive production. Now, going back to um, the first uh, speaker, you spoke about um, the challenges of uh, in the poultry value chain. From your presentation, I perceive you are somebody that has access to all that the environment provides for the development of the poultry chain in Nigeria, the finance and all that. Now, I'm happy there is the, uh, the, a principal from a school, the Leventis Foundation School on this chat. Maybe she will bear me witness. I work there as a value chain expert. And this is a school that turns out about 500 students per year from, uh, uh, from an agricultural school. But the challenge, as I said before, I'm an agricultural value chain expert by training. And the biggest challenge on the continent is located in other things like the finance system, the trade and marketing system, the uh, erratic, irregular policies, you know? So I am looking forward to us addressing specific things. Of course, the technical areas of value chain analysis is very okay, but you see, it's just one system. The, the governance system, there's the credit system, this the trade policies the, uh, and marketing systems. Of course, the facilitation systems are there. So I was looking forward, if you can still throw light, for example, if a youth wants to come out of this Leventis Foundation School, I'm speaking, uh, Mrs. Agnes is here. She can bear you witness that they turned out a lot of students, but I did an analysis of the extraneous of that school because I work there as the development and liaison officer. These people go back and they don't have any sustenance. They don't have any access to, uh, to uh, credit. Uh, the credit is being spoken about, but it is not available to people like this that have trained for one year and they go back to the local systems of production. Another very important thing is this, that in the value chain, my personal work on the value chain analysis shows that the bottlenecks are mostly at the level of post-harvest management, the downstream sectors of the chain, which uh, are very, very uh, cost intensive. So if we need people, uh, if we have access, if there is a way that you as a person who is in the poultry um, uh, area in Nigeria, you have access, of course, to most of these uh, uh, facilities that uh, people, youths can be, enter into uh, the, the downstream sector, not of course only of poultry, but other things. It will pull production upstream. It will pull the production. So back to the school now, uh, I'm really looking forward to an opportunity where the school, because we're training people in agribusiness, Challenges in agribusiness, there's a migration today from the local way of doing things. We have global value chains today. Every country, including Nigeria, is a member of WTO. We have a trade organization, we have to open our borders. And these cheap products are coming from everywhere. So now what I'm saying is that I'm really looking forward to that since we are training in agribusiness development, in Nigeria, in Africa as a whole, we are looking forward to the, to the time when the school can organize value chain analysis in different areas and really provide uh, the, uh, 
because if you do the value chain analysis, you will have the bottlenecks. What we are talking now is just talk. Eh? When you go down to do the value chain analysis, it is then that you will get the bottlenecks, the pressure points in the different areas, and then you develop some projects that around the bottlenecks, that is when we'll start talking. So I was looking forward to getting you, bringing maybe a value chain analysis report, bring it here and tell us we have bottlenecks here and there are possibilities, financial uh, assistance, policy, uh, whatever that can help people integrate into some specific areas along the value chain, maybe starting with poultry and maybe forward then going with others. So uh, it's just a recommendation I'm making that this very, school, very, yeah. Very, very, very Thank wonderful you. recommendation you have made. I, I want to quickly pose her contribution as a question. I would like to solicit your response from Dr. Anandaraj and from Professor Raphael. From Mary Ibenosa's contribution, I want to pose this question. And the question is, who takes the lead in value chain development? Should we wait for the government or is it entirely a private sector driven activity? Uh, who takes the lead, government or private sector? <laughs> All right, let's hear, doctor. <clears throat> From my point of view, uh, since this poultry is organized industry, so the private sector will take a lead than the government. If you are waiting for the government, it will not, uh, it will not succeed. Thank you, Dr. Naraj. Professor Raphael, the government or the private sector, who takes the lead? He said both. Ah. I said both. Because if the private sector leads alone, of course it's easier uh, and the economies, in the liberal economy, the private sector leads. But how many times it happened that the private sector moved somewhere else because of the government situation, because of taxes, because of subsidies, and because of uh, uh, the, systemic, uh, the systemic issue. So yes, the private sector normally, unfortunately, leads. But without a, a proper government approach for the system and for the economical system of a country or a, or, or a continent, uh, uh, the private sector would, would never survive alone. In Europe, we are, we, are, we are living a good situation now, now since, since the 70s, actually, when the CAP, so the Common Agricultural Policy, started to help farmers uh, into the value chain. And uh, uh, we can't survive without, without that. In a, in a, in a, of course, the, 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 the private sector can be innovative by itself, can, can create business that are uh, uh, more uh, profitable, but the system is based on uh, on both from my from my point of view, or at least it has to be from both parties. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will quickly pick some more questions. <coughs> Hamza Ali is asking: Agriculture is capital intensive, and there need to be some subsidy from government. Is there any model that can overcome this? There's depending on government subsidies. Is there a model that can capture this? So what do you mean? I don't know. The, if, the, if there is another model that can be uh, uh, used and applied to the agribusiness, there are existing, existing models already for subsidies in, uh, in Europe, like I was saying before, and in America too. The farm bill is based on subsidies for farmers and the value chain, into the entire value chain. Uh, um, there are also European investment for Africa and for in, in European investments, uh, uh, actually European uh, companies that invest in Africa uh, uh, as a private sector with the government. And there are also uh, a lot of um, uh, agency of UN, the most important one is UNIDO, UN in, in Industrial Development Organization that helps uh, industrials to go into the countries and with the public uh, the, the public support to uh, develop strategies for new businesses and to uh, uh, improve the situation. Uh, 
Ah, or, of course, uh, without having public subsidies. Uh, okay, it wasn't clear for me. I'm sorry. I said that it was a model to be used by crowdfunding. I don't believe in crowdfunding, actually, in, uh, not for farming. I mean, there are, there are few experiences, but it's most something that is a fashion thing from what I've read, what I've, what I've learned. You know, we are supporting you because you are finding uh, the way to produce in a romantic way something that you know, was going to disappear uh, without our crowd. No, we are talking about creating real business that goes uh, to the future. Uh, cooperative is not a system of funding. Cooperative is a system for, uh, for having people, having uh, workers together, um, suppliers or um, and, and, and split the costs in, uh, from somehow. It, so there are, it's plenty of, we're not inventing the wheel here. Uh, I think that the, we, we, we don't have to uh, consider public subsidies or private or public investment with, with like, like a, a, an evil thing. It's an opportunity, why don't, why don't, why, why don't grab it? Yeah. I'm positive with that. Yes. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think, Raj? And I'm yes. better, better that. From my point of view, the subsidies. I, uh, what you said is most of the countries they have subsidies for a Greek. Even <laughs> Nigeria also we have a lot of subsidy scheme, like Ankar Barrow scheme, so many scheme. But so far the subsidies are not uh, gone to the right direction, and the, all these schemes are uh, failed. Be honest, that is the truth. What's the, what's the reason? Why why they fail? Because the reason is the first of all, if if you take one particular case of uh, uh, cash loan, they are eligible for uh, each company is eligible uh, eligible for uh, one uh, billion naira something like that. So mm -hmm. whatever is there, it is going to the the top some ten people. So it is not able to go to the, so they were seeing, okay, total allotted fund is this much. It okay, will right. divided by only the 1% of the top. So they go to the, to the, to the, yes. the same people. So for example, be honest with you, I assessed close to 10 billion Naira from the CBN at the single digit interest. How the farmers will take this one? That is one. And second part, if you are doing for some scheme like Angkor Barrio scheme, we are directly, we are giving to the chicks and feed everything to the farmers at free of cost because of the government scheme. If you see the efficiency of the program, even it's less than 5%. So some of our people, they are taking the feed and they are selling to someone. So each farmer we are giving, assuming 200 chicks with the four bags of feed, okay, assuming they will use this feed, they will, the bears will grow, they will collect some eggs, it will be nutritious for their kids. Uh, that is what the government policy, but the efficiency when we read that is less than 5%. Okay. So the monitoring and evaluation is, uh, is uh, poor. Mm. I see. I really appreciate your insights and experience. Having spent 12 years in the Nigerian poultry industry, I want to quickly ask, um, it's a, a question that truly bothers me. As glo the global concern tends towards the health and the quality of our food, the food we eat, and uh, the, pro the process of producing this food, What do you think about the production of organic food in Nigeria? How close are we to this at the commercial scale? I don't know is the situation of the organic production in, in Nigeria. I'm sorry, I, I didn't study it. I, I can only tell you that the quality is the key for surviving. And for quality, I mean, uh, uh, not just a tasty one, but also a safe one. And not always organic means that it's more safe. This is a, this is a big fake news. 
that organics is equal is equal to safe. It's not it's not always true. Also, the unorganic, the conventional one, can be safe as well. Do you agree? It's, it's interesting to hear that. <laughs> it's true. Uh, have, have you ever thought of Dr. Nanda Raj? Organic yes. Chick, chick, yes. Organic Actually, the organic farming, when you are saying, I'll talk about agriculture, poultry, there is two points. One is, there is already a short supply of food. Then how this organic farming will going to be commercial? So if the whatever you are producing organic, the production cost will be very high and compared to the commercial production, are you able to get the premium price? No. That is a big question. No. So the way is how to avoid residues in the commercial production. How to avoid residues, antibiotic residues or whatever the residues, how to reduce. That is the focus we're supposed to be there. For example, if you, if you take the developed countries, uh, even developing countries, most of the countries in poultry, last seven days, they are not supposed to use any medication to avoid, no, residues, no. Anti to avoid residues in the meat. Antibiotics, you mean? Antibiotics. Even they are gone for, uh, apart from antibiotics, even some countries, the, the antibiotic is banned. They want to go for... Uh, yeah. acidic bias or whatever this one. So that is the way to focus. If you go for organic, whether we can commercially, we cannot produce the value, uh, the volume, the quantity, which already we are in shortage in the country for food shortage. And secondly, the premium price we, we are not going to get. This is my opinion. I agree with you. You, it's It's very easy to get the premium price, at least if you transform it. For the transformed product, I mean, if you sell the 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 chicken i'm talking about poultry the chicken alive you won't get the primer the, the 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 premium price if you transform the meat and you sell it for organic you will have the premium price it, it is the same with wine it's the same with uh, with pasta with the same with uh, if you transform it and you go to the market in a different with a different um uh, buyer you will get the premium price this is my, my, I mean, this is what I, I'm, I'm learning in, in, with all the people I'm talking about in, in, in many continents. The premium price is, for organic is only if you are able to transform and sell it to the final consumers. consumers. That brings me to my next, my next question and concern because the, the farmers or the players in agribusiness at the downstream, majorly the, at the production level, if you look at their books, they remain poor. And I think straight away, uh, Professor Raphael may have made a, an indirect reference to this, because when you produce without adding any form of value, you may not get a premium price. This probably is caused by uh, the poor value chain thinking. But are we saying in essence that every farmer should have some form of value addition in order to have a positive balance or profit in their, in, their, in their farming activities. Must every farmer have a form of value addition, not just produce your maize, convert it to grit, not just produce your soya beans, convert it to meal, not just produce your chicken, convert it to must that be the, the practice for small scale farmers? I don't know if my question is clear. It is already started in the bigger level operations, not mm -hmm. with the small scale farmers. <clears throat> for example, as of today, uh, what the soya seeds, uh, everybody is extracting oil and they're exporting, and they're using. So, so many byproducts like each and every products. So, but it's started in the bigger level, not at the farmer level. <clears throat> and, you, okay. and you asked why the poor farmers, farmers are still is poor. The reason is that between the farmer and the customer, at least three middlemen are there in Nigeria. But everywhere, everywhere, it happened everywhere. <laughs> 
because size, as I said before, size matter, unfortunately. To 30% because profit. If, if they don't get together with other smallholder, they will remain always poor because they will never have a scale economy, uh, a different approach, a positive approach for the market with a massive production. They will always remain small. Size matter in, agri in agriculture. Great, great. Size, size matters in agriculture. Yeah. I, I would like you to tell our listeners what we can do to key into the African continental free trade area discussion that is, is a very it's a heated discussion currently. The Af it's called the African continental free trade area. I believe Dr. Anandaraj is familiar with this. I, I missed the conversation, please. Can you repeat yes. it? Yes, I'm asking um, how can listeners or those participating in this meeting, how can we key into the African continental free trade area discussion that is going on in Africa? The free trade area discussion. The African continental free trade area, I believe you must have heard or you're familiar with. Yes, sir. Actually, there were some initiatives like uh, free trade, uh, COAS free trade. <coughs> yes, uh, but uh, uh, in industry wise, it is not much effective. And most of the African countries, they are in short of shortage of, uh, especially the food uh, production. If, if, for example, if, uh, if uh, from Nigeria, if you want to export to Ghana, Ghana is uh, import free of the chicken. So price from Brazil is cheaper than price from Ghana, Nigeria. Wow. Why? Because of price of because, costs. Costs are lower. And yeah, size. production cost is less. So yeah. somebody is buying chicken from Nigeria to Ghana, from, uh, if, uh, from the Ghana, if they want to take from Nigeria, if they want to take from Brazil, the Brazil from the Brazil is cheaper. So then how we can export? For example, if you take the statistics, uh, well, the highest chicken consumption is Rebel Republic of Benin. Can you believe this one? Well, the highest chicken consumption is Republic of Benin. They are not at all consuming. It means they are importing because it's import free. So from there, it will go to Nigeria, Ghana, all these places. There's also a marketing. There's also a marketing thing. You have to push on some internal demand uh, uh, for for chicken or for whatever, also for rice and for all the production you have. I mean, you are. I think the Nigeria is the biggest country in Africa, right? Free trade is possible. Only we are able to meet the cost of production with the international cost of production. Yeah, there's also, I don't know how much you pay the energy to the workers, uh, the logistic. And also you don't have probably any marketing campaign for internal, for internal consumption, to push for the internal consumption. And, uh, and you have to consider the trader too. They have uh, contracts since decades with the Brazilian, which you just mentioned the Brazilian, but uh, the, the, look at the, the traders come from other countries and they have contracts. And uh, uh, I mean, there were policy on that too. So it's, a, it's an old system that you have to deal with. It's not a... It's not a, a, a one-day solution to be found, you know? It's, uh, but this is why the private sector can win a lot, can't win a lot. The, 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 the policy maker has, are important for this kind of, for this kind of regulations. And costs and things. I, I, I will take my final question, then I will entertain one or two questions from our audience. 
my final question to both of you would be uh, what you have seen as mistakes that have been made by developed nations, nations that have, have gone ahead in agriculture, what mistakes have been made that you can advise a nation like Nigeria not to toe that path? We know they have, they are, there are nations that have, have developed the agricultural business system, but they've made some mistakes that we can learn from. Can you pick any of these mistakes that uh, we shouldn't copy or imitate? Ma Madame, Madame, Madame McBino says she is right. I mean, addressing the, the African free trade area is not my, my field area. So uh, I'm sorry if I had some, if, if I was superficial on my answer, but normally talking, I believe that, you know, uh, what I say, this, it can be related to Nigeria too. If you want to get deeper, of course, you need someone who's more expert in that, in that specific issue. So she's totally right. Great, great. So I, I'll just add to like to hear from Dr. Nance. Just I want to say some of the countries where I worked in the same poultry business, I want to give a small comparison. <clears throat> if we take some countries, even if we take India, the power supply to agriculture and the poultry agriculture related is the free of cost. <clears throat> Whereas we are, we are using the power cost is a major cost. That is one. Like this type of things, and especially the subsidies, really is reaching to the farmers. Most of the countries. So that one. And very importantly, <clears throat> there is a cooperative system. Yeah, we're, we're discussing <laughs> about that. The, the, Agnes says that the cooperative system failed. <clears throat> but why? Maybe there was corruption. Maybe there were leaders. Maybe there was no innovation. Maybe they were just there because of some interest in of a small, of a small percentage of the cooperative runners. Now with the, with, the, with, the, with the access to information we have and the access to knowledge that we have, we can create system of cooperative, but cooperative is just an example, it can be consortium, can be companies, can be uh, uh, any, any, other, any other, I don't know how the regulation works for, for, for multiple people companies in, uh, in Nigeria. For example, in Italy, not in Europe, in Italy, we have a system that, um, that, can, that allows us to create network of farmers remaining and keeping your own uh, legal personality, which doesn't mean that you have to put and stay into cooperative, but you're part of a net and you can hire people, you can buy seeds, you can access to market together with the others, but you remain your own uh, owner of your own business. Uh, um, and it's a very interesting model that we are using quite a lot. I have a network of companies. I'm, my company is in a network of companies. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Let me pick very one much. question. Let me pick one question from the audience. Olaulu Akogun is asking, as it's been discussed, there are vast opportunities and gaps along the agricultural value chain in Nigeria. How can we leverage on ag tech? agricultural technology for improvements, considering the high cost of technology in the country. So we're looking at how can we leverage on agri-technology for improvements? Maybe one or two practical examples. Can I? Yes, please. This is what I normally say, this is what I normally do with my, with my home business. You have two different way of approaching technologies. If you are able to uh, uh, to calculate your ROI, so your return of investment, investing in new technology, you will buy based on your own business. So the size of the business, uh, and what you're trying to do, what kind of technology you are inve you're investing in, uh, you can be able to do that. But on the other way around, the other option is, is, is it's very much fascinating and not very much used. There are a lot of suppliers that become your uh, partners in supplying for that technology. And uh, we are using this approach for many, many innovations. 
but a lot. And there's a big, big international system of technology. Look at the farm management system, for example, technology. If you're not allowed to have your own farm management system and buy things, uh, you can go online and using a cloud. This is just a stupid example, but it's useful. For example, there's one called X Farm, which I use, and I also invest into that, which is a farm management system platform, which is completely free for farmers. And uh, uh, after that, you use the farm management system, you can decide to buy technology and buy uh, uh, um, innovation system as GPS or tractors or whatever is that, it's plenty of, or you can decide just to, uh, uh, to, to lend it for a while. And the this is the open innovation system. This is the, 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 the world is going towards the open innovation and share economy. And agribusiness is not outside of this kind of approach. If you're big enough, you can decide that of, of buying your own technology. But if you're not big enough you, and you want to, uh, you don't want to have your technology to uh, become uh, obsolete in a while and make new investment, you can approach a technology supplier. It's full. The word is, I don't, I mean, it's really full. Cool. Dr. Amandarat, anything on technology? Oh, sorry, you can't hear me. Yes. Okay. The technology, like what the professor said, with the cooperation with the foreign investment is possible. The typical example is the chief firms. Okay. The what? Typical example to, to with, do with the uh, foreign collaboration and foreign investment, okay? <clears throat> so the typical example, I can say the chief firms. You, you have people who heard about the chief firms. So yeah. what do we have that the latest technology is available in our farming sectors, especially the breeder farms, hatchery, GP farms, everything. It is the international standard. So that means we are collaborated with the Aviagen, <clears throat> USA, we are collaborated with Hendrix Genetics New Netherlands. We are collaborated with the Peter Syme for hatchery equipments. We are collaborated with the Big Dutchman uh, for uh, farm equipments. So uh, the reason why we done, so there is a big difference in terms of performance. Like what I said, the, uh, the normal uh, open side houses and the environmentally controlled houses, there is a, uh, series of uh, 20 to 25 percent production performance the efficiency is there so the technology is the only way to increase the the production and the performance so it uh, i don't think it will be possible without the collaboration of new investments or foreign investments those uh, are having the technologies interesting Interesting. Because we cannot we cannot start again the research to find the technology. It will take another 50 years. So the easiest way to collaborate with them to bring the technology to improve our production. Very true. Very true. I know my time is fast spent, but I will pick the last question from the audience before I hand over to the didactic team. I want to pick if it's more or less like a reaction to the statement that size matters in agribusiness. It's true. And uh, I can see one or two reactions, which means we need money in order to venture into large scale agriculture. How The question is how do we cross the bridge? But I want to rephrase that question. Can you give hope to a small farmer listening to you that he can make profit? Yeah, totally. They have to start working with the others. It's a, a, agribusiness is a, is a strange business field because everyone is a king in, on his own land. And this is, this, this is not happening with other, with other business sectors. Ask you why. Why the other sectors go and grow and you can scale up other sectors because they are open to make money. 
asking the help of the uh, uh, of the farmers can be the solution and of course the, of course you're going to need an organization or a company or a cooperative or whatever is the international organization that can help you to build this or a university but it's impossible to survive you, you rem if you remain a smallholder. It's very, very difficult. Uh, with, with GFAR, with the Global Foreign Agriculture Research, we were part of developing this global manifesto on forgotten food uh, for development. It's an interesting manifesto, super interesting manifesto. FAO is, uh, is working with, with that. IFAD is working with that. Agrobiodiversity is working with that. And CGIR system of the of the uh, the research in agribusiness um, for the United Nations. Uh, because we are pushing on um, dead crops that are going to, uh, to disappear because every, everybody are producing, everybody are producing uh, just corn, maize, uh, uh, wheat, and this kind of cereals. This, the, the, the forgotten crops will have smallholder farmer to uh, to keep alive because the demand is uh, the demand is good and we mapped in Africa we, we mapped uh, 400 um, crops that are going to be to disappear then a possible investment we can discuss about that in a in a future event if you want wow, but I'm so, trying I'm so to work to try to work together with the others if you need a tractor don't buy it by yourself buy a tractor with your neighborhood people at your uh, um, the people the, the people that operate close to you it's impossible scaling up scaling up is the is the is the is the, is the solution thank you thank you very much professor Raphael. final words from dr nandaraj uh, a word of encouragement to this small farmer listening to you yeah <clears throat> Actually, like what Professor said, the in the in agri business, the, the everybody is keen on their own land. That is the basic thing. For example, it's not only the technical knowledge, and very importantly, territory knowledge is needed for success of any agri business. Even though if you know, if you are very strong master in poultry in USA, if you don't know the territory of knowledge of uh, Nigeria, you cannot succeed. So that, that is the biggest advantage of the small farmer. Those are living, they know what is the situation, the weather condition, uh, how to manage all this one. So uh, smallholder farmers, they have to be, the, still I'm hoping there is a big solution is the cooperatives. I can see one, I, I can give one small example of the cooperative. There is a cooperative called Amul. Maybe you heard about Amul in India. It started in a smaller way. As of now, I think close to 800 farmers are cooperative. In that cooperative, 800,000 800, farmers are there in that cooperative. 800,000, not 800 farmers. So the biggest cooperative in the world, they're producing 3.5 million liters per day. It is not started in one day. 3.5 million liters in one day. There is the CEO or head or president is all appointed by the cooperatives. So if you if you see Amul, you can get that. So still there is a hope. The farmers, wherever they go there, farmers are completely genuine with other business people. They are, they are less uh, corrupted than other business people. So the cooperative is the the best solution as far as me concerned, because I witnessed, I was worked with Amul for some period. <clears throat> Just imagine 800,000 farmers is united as a cooperative. It's not one day, it is close to 40 years before. They started with five farmers, 10 farmers, 3.3 million liters in a day, all 365 days. They have around uh, more than 25 process in the milk, uh, a patch recession plant. So cooperative, still there is a hope in the country. That is the way to farmers to, to get together to get that benefit. So, 
that's all my uh, uh, last message to the people and i'm very thankful for this opportunity and any of our student if they want to get any information about nigerian poultry industry thank you if they want to get any uh, information on nigerian poultry industry they can contact me thank you thank you very much i noticed a signal from professor rafael you wanted to add to that no actually i i'm happy that at the end we were aligned on uh, on this on, on, on solution and, and, and kind of problem. I'm, I'm looking very much forward to being with you in the next future as, uh, as if you, if you, I mean, if you will invite me, I'll be honored because today was a, a very interesting conversation we had and uh, being part of RBS, Brown Business School too, would be also amazing for me coming and visiting you because as I said before, we have a lot of people, a lot of students from Nigeria every year that come to Rome or they are connected to the agribusiness management course. And uh, uh, the average of them, they are very cool, actually. They are already uh, full of skills and full of uh, uh, energy, and they want to proceed with, this, with, the, with, the, with, the, um, with the knowledge and the information uh, approach. So I'm, I'm amazed by the, by the people you are sending to to the agribusiness management course. So uh, I'd be happy to, to join you in the future if you, if, if, I mean, if you want. <laughs> I hope that I, 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 I hope that I satisfied your, your, <coughs> your, um, your needs. Very much, yes. And <laughs> this session has been a real eye opener. And uh, you mentioned 400 crops, special crops that are ready. Yeah, I have a list of that. I can share maybe. Please, I love to see that. And that's an opportunity, that's an entry point for many who are saying, I want to go into the agribusiness. Wow. Right about this point, I'll be handing over to you on full care. Thank you for the opportunity to have moderated this session. Please, uh, I will pass the ball back to you. Thank you very much. Thank very you much. very how, much, Daniel. How can I share, how can I share a document? Here's the, the global manifest. Okay, you can share on the group chat, or you, should, also, you can also send to career service um, um, email address. And share with so for students who cannot access on the group chat, they can always access it on the okay. uh, through the career service Nigeria. Thank you very much, um, Raphael. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was a very interesting and engaging section. I really appreciate Dr. Andra Anna. I'm not even proud of pronouncing You can, pronounce you can you call Dr. Dr. Raj. Ananda Raj. Thank you so much for joining us on this, um, you know, on this section. We really appreciate your input. I've gained a lot from this agribusiness. I'm not an agribusiness um, person, but I'm able to learn a lot. And from what that I've been able to gain from this section, I've been able to know how to start my own agribusiness. I've been able to identify the challenges and the trends. So I think from this section, I've been able to know what to do, the right step to take, you know, when it comes to agribusiness. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all your input. I want to say a big thank you to the students who participated. They were really, we very, very engaging. I've been following the chat. That was very, 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 very good. I really appreciate your presence. It was active and it was very engaging. Uh -huh. Not for you. I'm very sure this would not be as you no, know, very interesting. But because you were here and you made it a very fantastic one, we appreciate you. And we always look forward to have more sections with you from the career service department. Thank you so much. On behalf of the country director, I want to say thank you for the to the speakers, Dr. Ananda Raj. Mr. Um, Professor Raphael, thank you so much. We really appreciate the My time. Pleasure. We really appreciate you so well. And also, I'm also extending my greetings from uh, Italy, our <laughs> dean. <laughs> Our Antonio. dean, Professor Ragusa, is also extending his greeting and his appreciation to you. Thank you so much for joining us on this event. Really appreciate and we look forward to seeing more, you know, more, more opportunities with you. And I'm sure that the students are also expecting more opportunities with you. Please, um, um, stood, uh, for executive student, I would advise that you slide into the, um, the LinkedIn page of um, these wonderful speakers. So you have more and more information if, 
requires in terms of information that you're not able to ask during this section, this is an opportunity to connect with the speakers and get more information that will be useful for your business. Thank you so much and have a lovely Bye. day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye-bye. I've shared the Bye. already to your mail. Bye. Bye. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you.